I should correct one thing. I'm, I'm not an expert in, in Shakespeare. I, I dabble in Shakespeare. You know, theatre is my passion. Theatre education is my passion. The relationship between participatory forms of theatre and democracy is my passion, and I and I love Shakespeare for that reason and his part in that. So don't expect experts. I expert view of Shakespeare, and I'm very pleased and honoured to be part of this lecture series. Although when I first got the publicity, it's all we can have 50 lectures. I'm the 50. <laughs> that mean you're really scraping the bottom of the bar. Oh, <laughs> we're going to have to give a oh, I, I need a boy, we'll, we'll bring him in here, sort of thing. <laughs> anyway, and I should also say what I do, and what uh, hopefully Victoria students are excited by, is, is workshops. I'm not a hugely great speaker, but I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and do my best over the evening and try to relate these three concepts, these three ideas of Shakespeare, theatre and democracy, and education, of course, as it does to everything, forms the, the background to, to that and the lives of the children in our classrooms and their futures uh, is what it's pretty much about, I guess. So we start with a picture of Michael Gove. And we start with uh, Thomas Carlyle's great law of culture, let each become all that he was created capable of being. And I kind of put it up because he did look like a, a, a teacher in a classroom failing to get the attention of his classroom. You kind of wonder what you might be. You pay attention to me. Excuse me, young lady, I'm speaking to you. Of course you'll love Shakespeare and Dryden and George Eliot and all of those other books which I think that you should read. But I also wanted to put it up because it's a, you know, an interesting reminder of what it means to live in a democracy. Um, Michael, um, uh, Michael Gove is, of course, as entitled to his ideas as anyone else. You know, one of the important freedoms that we have is the freedom of expression. One of the great responsibilities that we have is to work with and develop the, school, the skills to live with those who hold very different views about the world and how it should be organised and how it should be governed. So he has every right. However, it's not quite democratic, is it? Because, for instance, he has power that I don't have, which means that we're not sat equally in freedom of expression or in any public forum. There doesn't seem to be much dialogue, and as I'll keep stressing, dialogue is essential to a democratic life and a democratic education. And we probably also argue around Thomas Carlyle. I'm sure we both agree that it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful law of nature, but we might disagree what we mean by each, because by each I mean all, not an elite or a select few. We might certainly argue about he, and suggest that in a modern world that's no longer an appropriate pronoun. And we might certainly also uh, argue about what we mean by capable of all that he was capable of being, all that he was capable of being, not just the stem bit or the measured bit, but all the other bits which make us human and make us full and make us whole as well. I should also warn you, in case you want to leave quickly, that the talk is not about Shakespeare, but it is also all about Shakespeare, in the sense that he was an artist working in turbulent times, times that threatened the very existence of secular arts like theatre, and yet at the same time, one in three Londoners went to the theatre at least once a month. It was part of their life. It was part of their reality. One in three Londoners went to the theatre at least once a month. Because his plays were part of a social conversation, and the circulation of ideas of this turbulent time, and making turbulence in turbulent times, if you like, a questioning, a probing, a respect for the intellectual as well as the entertainment needs of these audiences. And we are, of course, living now in turbulent times where the arts and humanities are again under threat in society, in higher education, and more, most importantly, in those schools and communities which serve the most disadvantaged and powerless children and young people. And I want to be clear from the start about the central theme of this lecture, which is that the government's assault on the arts and humanities is also an assault on the development of the critical, social and lived capabilities required for a democratic life. They're not decorations. They're essential. We need bread, but we need roses too. And I don't believe that the assault, the marginalising, the withdrawal of resources is accidental. 
I actually think, as we'll hope to show as the talk progresses, that it is a deliberate, <coughs> considered assault on the ability of young children, particularly disadvantaged ones, to gain from the power that the arts can bring into their lives. And there is, of course, another sense in which this lecture is about Shakespeare. He was more or less, Sarah will probably disagree, he was more or less a working class boy living in a small market town who was given a scholarship that gave him a grammar school education taught by an Oxford trained teacher. And if the good people of Stratford had not identified and fed his talents, if education had not given him exposure to great culture, he would never have gained the tools he needed to make his art. There would never have been a Shakespeare if his school experiences of the arts had been as impoverished as in our own time. 500 years, 2016. Shakespeare was spotted, nurtured, educated. How many Shakespeare's might be sitting in our classrooms who might go unnoticed? What would have happened if the people of Stratford had not given him that scholarship? That's how important education is, education for all. Let each become all that he was created capable of being. But we'll start with theatre and Shakespeare, and we'll start with this great woman, of course. Because she was the master of applied theatre in her own time. Applied <laughs> theatre used for political ends. When we remember this period for the great flowering of early modern theatre, for Shakespeare and others, but of course it was Elizabeth I who was the great and towering figure of the times. Now, Shakespeare's audience was still living in the aftermath of the Reformation, the shift in economic power to a new mercantile class, a rapid urbanisation of the population, the stirrings of republicanism and religious fundamentalism with its hatred of theatre and other forms of entertainment. These times demanded new forms of expression, new vocabulary and rhetorical and theatrical tricks to match the acceleration of social change, mobility, fear of chaos. Shakespeare was born in the crossroads of his turbulent times. But Elizabeth, with no army, no police, no heir, and in deep Elizabeth, I have no idea what that means. <coughs> no heir, used surveillance, spies, see that? spectacle, procession, and public and bar bar barbaric executions, torture and maiming, to create at least an illusion of order and control. So for the Elizabethans, who might watch the odd maiming, execution, <coughs> disembowelment on the way to the globe, the theatre meant the world, not an artificial construction or fiction of it. It meant the world. And going to it meant being part of the world, in the world, in public social conversation with the, with the world. And there is a view that the audience in Shakespeare's time made no distinction between the reality of the stage and the reality of the severed heads and disemboweled entrails of the executed. It was all theatre, or none of it was. And I want as an example of that, just to turn our attentions to Henry V. This was a, um, a cartoon that appeared in a, an Australian newspaper whilst I was there teaching Henry V, as it happens. And it was the day after a, a, an Australian soldier was, was uh, killed in Afghanistan, and it had as that strap line, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. And you can see all the iconography, and we're familiar with how that play has been used iconographically and rhetorically, you know, over time as a kind of symbol of patriotism and the, and the courage of war. But of course you dig back into the circumstances of this play's first performance, you get a very different picture, and you come to understand a very different Shakespeare, I think. The play was first performed at the newly reconstructed Globe on the South Bank in the spring of 1559. 1599. The nerves will go, look, as we keep going, I'll be a smile at me, look, the nerves will start to go. <laughs> it was Henry V. There had been earlier versions of Henry V performed which were closer to the jingoistic and iconically English ideas some still have of Shakespeare's Henry V. But Shakespeare's new interpretation from the very beginning was to be very different. But what was happening outside the theatre? This was at a low point in the nine-year Irish rebellion that lasted from 1594 to 1603. 
It was September 1598, Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, ambushed a British force of 4,000 at the Battle of Yellow Ford and massacred the wounded and the prisoners. He cut their throats. Others deserted and ran away. Only 2,000 survived. So that was only just a few months before. At the time that Henry V was first being performed, the Earl of Essex was raising an army of 16,000 men to take revenge and quash the Irish Rebellion. This was an army of conscripts, many forced into service. Merchants in London were, beginning, were being aggressively taxed to pay for this army. Some in the audience would have been ready and loyal, others bitter at losing brothers, sons and fathers, and others because they were being taxed for a war that they didn't believe. And it was led, it was rumoured, by the Queen's lover. Shortly after the play, by September 1599, as, Sh as Shakespeare was beginning to write Hamlet, 75% of that force of 16,000 men would die or be killed. And Essex returned humiliated and accused of treason and would be the last person to be beheaded in the Tower of London in 1601. The first audiences for Henry V understood how political and relevant it was to what was actually happening around them. Like us, they were living with the reality of war and looking to the theatre for a shared experience and social conversation. 100,000 soldiers and civilians died during the Nine Year Rebellion. So the importance of Henry V that it was that it wasn't a pro-war play, it wasn't an anti-war play, it was a being at war play. Shakespeare knew that his audience would be divided. Shakespeare knew that there would be people who held very different views. He knew he had to hold them in the globe. And he knew he had to walk that path through the play. And it comes out cleverly in the struggle. We all know the famous lines, but we tend to forget, for instance, the speech before the walls of Harfleur. Harfleur. That the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants spitted upon pikes, whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds. Therefore, you men of half lore, take pity of your town and of your people. If not, and later, of course, in the famous interaction between Williams and the king, William says, but if the cause be not good, the king himself have a heavy reckoning to make, when all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in battle shall join together at the latter day and cry, oh, we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the depths they owe, some upon their children rawly left. I am afeard there are few die well that die in a battle. It's not a pro-war play, it's not an anti-war play, it's a being at war play. It'd been interesting if Michael Gove had been Chancellor, Lord Chancellor or the master of the King's Queen's Rebels at that time, of course, mm -hmm. and considered Shakespeare to be deeply unpatriotic and not supporting the brave <laughs> people who went to fight a righteous war. <laughs> well, and, then are, and then he ends up, of course, creating a, committing a, a war crime by cutting the throats of his prisoners. But he was writing in a long tradition. Theatre was the first invention of democracy. When the people of Athens, for whatever reason, decided that they would emerge from the determinism of nature and gods, when they discovered that the fire Prometheus stole from the gods also brought the democratic inventions of critique and choice, the power to both question how we live and the freedom to choose and change the laws by which we live. They didn't do all of that work and then decide we need a less, let's invent theatre because we need an escape. Archaeology shows us that theatre was there from the very beginning. It was actually necessary and vital to the political world. And that is why Aristotle placed it alongs alongside the other practical arts of philosophy and politics, not with dance and music and poetry, but with philosophy and politics. And these gifts of self-determination, critique and choice are, of course, the hallmarks of a lively, inclusive and participatory society. And I want to pause on that word democracy in case we're confused. I'm talking about 
Democracy as an ideal, as a beacon, as a seed, as a guiding light. Not something which has ever existed, and not something which I expect to exist in my lifetime or in my children's lifetime, but something that guides us, something which is the best alternative that we have when we turn to consider how best do we live together, and how do we do that with fairness and with equity, and how, we, how do we gather together to make rules that are freely accepted, and how do we gather together to critique those very same rules and make different choices about how we might live. And although the sociologist Alexis de Tocqueville was talking about a corrupt America at the time, it's still true what he says, I think, that democracy is the most continuous, ancient, and permanent tendency known to man, and theatre has always been essential to it, in both of its guises. In terms of tragedy, tragedy offered the polis of Athens the opportunity to consider who they were and who they were become. People went to tragedy to ask the question, what should I, what should we do? And just as Henry V wrote and performed, Hen uh, uh, sorry, Henry V, it says Shakespeare wrote and performed Henry V in period of war, so did the Athenians have plays that they performed during war, notably the Persians and the Trojan women. The Persians, of course, tell, told the Athenians the story of what happens after defeat. This is what happened to our enemies after defeat. But its moral was, our enemies are not animals. Be reminded, they are human. They love, they live, they think. They are like us. And remember that as we fight. And then later, of course, the Trojan women, which was performed a year after the Athenians had mindlessly massacred the people of Milos and a reminder a year later of the shame. Those plays were performed not as entertainment, but as part of the process of thinking about who we are and who we are becoming. But comedy and satire were also the invention of democracy and absolutely essential to democratic life. Because the Athenians, of course, decided we're not, or we're questioning at least, that we are determined by nature and gods. There is more than man can do but there is only so much that man can do. And if man oversteps the mark, then he goes into hubris and he will be destroyed. So comedy was a very good way of making sure that the rich, the corrupt, the selfish, the greedy, the overambitious were held to account. In the public place of the theater, we would hold them up for mockery. We would name them, we would shame them. They would squirm in their seats. It was a way of making sure that the excesses of humanity were not allowed to corrupt the dream, the beacon of democracy, which they were growing towards. And of course, as democracy descended into monarchy in Athens, what we began to see was the soap opera, you know, the comedy, the light entertainment, theatre stopped questioning power, who holds it, how it should be distributed, how we should live with it. This invention of theatre proved to be so powerful that even now, theatre can make the powerful fearful and is often banned or censored. The world looks to England for its theatre history. It's been banned for over 300 years of that history. Of all the arts, it's the one that the powerful most fear. And we live in turbulent times as well, of course. And this um, tension between chaos and order was an obsession for the early moderns, of course, not least because of the uncertainties of Elizabeth's hold on power. And I'll make the point that actually the tension between chaos and order is something which I've lived with all my life as a drama teacher. I cannot tell you how often I've teetered between chaos and order in the drama classroom and how rapidly it goes from, from one to the other. But that notion of chaos and order, and these pictures now, uh, some months old, how quickly uh, times become historical of events in Cairo, are to do with people struggling with that question of how best do we govern ourselves, how best do we live. And over history we've had you know, different answers to that. Secular, religious, monarchy, anarchy, aristocracy, oligarchy, plutocracy. 
But Amartya Sen makes this point about democracy. There has never been a famine in a democracy. There has never been a famine in a democracy. But he qualified that claim by saying there's never been a famine in a, in a fully functioning democracy. And by that he meant the society which enjoyed a free press, argument, and most crucially, the protection of minority rights for the most vulnerable and marginalised. And I would add to that list freedom and tolerance of artistic expression, which both challenged and offers new alternatives. Because in a fully working democracy, there is the freedom of the press to report on famine in other areas. It almost never happens that an entire country or an entire society is subject to famine. It is more often the case that it is localised. And in all the great famines of the 19th century, the, the Irish famines and the famines in India, there was plenty of food available. But there was no press to tell those who had resources to tell those living in the cities what was happening. And there was no concern for those who were disadvantaged, for those who had problems, for those who needed help, for those who were most vulnerable. But the other side of that coin is that elections are easy to fix, as we know. So democracy is not just about voting every four years or more, or allowing technocrats to rule on our behalf. It is about a process of being together, a way of us living and governing. And my suggestion is that this process, this democratic ambition and desire, begins in childhood. It is fed by the arts, it is developed and made political in drama classes and theatre, but it is often lost in adulthood, at least the soul of what democratic living together is supposed to be. And my story about that is of my own daughter, Poppy. We live in a terraced house, um, and out back is an alleyway. And we're fortunate because this is a gated alleyway, so it's a very safe adventure playground for children. And over, uh, over a summer, a group of children gathered and used this um, playground largely unobserved by adults. And they included Poppy, six at that time, uh, Charlie and Matt next door, one of whom was nine, the other one was three, a couple of other older kids down the road, uh, uh, a, a boy with some uh, challenging issues living next door, and they would all go out there and play together. They would know how to control my alpha female control freak daughter. <laughs> the, the strong did not exploit the weak. They came up with a temporary culture which for a while at least, created the illusion of equality amongst them. There's no point playing if you can win easily. Now, you want to participate, you want to find a way of being together and you negotiate those rules. And that's what children do. And they also negotiate the public in that way. You know, we send our children off into playgrounds, we send them out of the classroom into playground, we send them into all kinds of public spaces, and we don't consider for a minute how fearful that is. And in order to survive, what they do is to negotiate the public is to come up with a way of being, which is often based in play, because play allows them to be citizens. It's not Poppy who's playing, it's the child who's playing with other children. The interesting thing was that when the summer ended, all those children went to the same school and acted as if they didn't know each other. <laughs> because in a playground, obviously, it's not cool to say that you spent your time playing with three-year-olds and four-year-olds. But for a temporary period, they create a temporary culture, and they're a model for us. They're a model for us of how we might live in the world. Democracy is politics. It is participation. And it requires political participation. It requires dialogue, because without speaking to each other, how can we decide how best to live? And it absolutely requires public interaction. And schools, of course, should be places which encourage both participation, which teach and learn through dialogue and encourage dialogues of all kinds and one in which students interact with each other. And the problem of public interaction is becoming acute. We think of England and our cities as being a multicultural place, particularly, say, London. But we're into what some uh, geographers are now calling hyperdiversity. In other words, yes, London is diverse, but people don't mix 
They stay within their own enclave. They stay with their own class. They stay with their own ethnic group. They stay within their own neighborhood. There is no genuine crossing and mixing and interacting of people who are different. And if you don't interact with people who are different, you can't understand the challenges or develop the skills or develop the mindset to participate and be in dialogue with people who are different. And the philosopher Martha Nussbaum suggests to us that the three capabilities which are essential to a democratic life are the ability to think critically, to go back to the Athenians, it was the discovery of critique which led to the development of democracy. The ability to transcend local loyalties and to approach world problems as a system of the world. What the Athenians did was to say, we must put the good of the polis before clan, family or tribal interest. We have to do what is best for the common good. And the ability to imagine sympathetically the predicament of another person. To imagine what it would be like to suffer. What it would be like to have less. What it would be like to be on welfare. And my contention from the, from the opening theme is that these three, these three capabilities, which I've always assumed is what education is for, because it's the only common platform, platform that we have, are under attack. And they're under attack deliberately. And if we lose these capabilities, we lose the ambition to lead a democratic life. Interestingly for me, Democracy, play, drama, which we've talked about, and humanities education in particular, require these common characteristics. They're shared. They all require, for instance, a public space constituted for participatory and deliberative speech and action. When we go to a political meeting, we are told that it will occur at a certain time, in a certain place, it will last for so long, and when we're in that place, during that time, we will behave in a certain way in order to conduct our business. When children play together, they make an agreement that we will suspend everyday reality, everyday experience, and do something different in this space for this time, and it will come to an end. When we play a game, we take turns, the game comes to an end. When we go to the theatre, we are told that there will be a performance at 7.30 in such and such a place, and it will last for so long. So these are defined moments that allow the public to gather, to gather for particular purposes. But they're also constituted. In other words, people have to decide how they will behave in those places and in those times. By what rules they will, uh, they will agree to. And they're deliberative. They're called together in order to make things happen. Children play in order to make things happen. It's immaterial labour, but they make things happen. When we gather together politically, we do it to make things happen. When we go to the theatre, things happen. And the best classrooms are those where teachers treat the space as a place that needs to be constituted, where we need to have agreement and negotiation with students about how we will behave with each other whilst we are in this space. And that has to be something which they are included in. Because without that, there is unlikely to be deliberative speech and action. There has to be a quality of participation in the public sphere. We have to agree to put the common good before our own self-interest. And in drama, that's a very challenging thing for young people. It's very easy for an individual to completely destroy any chance of us being able to do drama today. It's very challenging to sit on your hands and resist that temptation and work instead for the common good. But children learn that from play. If you disrupt play, if you cheat, if you go for your own self-interest, children are not going to want to play with you. It's one of the first great cruel lessons of life. You will be shunned by other children. You will be considered, as the Athenians put it, to be apolitical, outside of politics. And there has to be freedom of speech and the right to criticism. But there also has to be restraint of speech and action. So we are free to say and do, but we also must restrain what we say and do. Because if not, we can't be together and talk with our differences. If you disagree with me and I punch you, that's the end of it. If you disagree and I go on a rant, that's the end of it. So learning this tension between freedom of, of speech and action, but also restraint of speech and action, is entirely necessary to democratic life. It's discovered in childhood, and it should be nurtured in classrooms. And most importantly, there have to be rules that are freely accepted, not fearfully followed. That's the real hallmark of a democracy for me. 
rules freely accepted, not fearfully followed. And the interesting thing about what I teach, drama, is that it has to be by choice. Students may know that at 9.30 you will go into the drama hall and it will be drama, but once they're in there, you can't make them do it. If I invite you to come and act, it has to be your choice. I can't drag you out of the chair and make you do it. Which means that drama teachers, where they've been successful, have had to develop a pedagogy of choice. A rich, negotiatory pedagogy, which it creates the illusion, at least, for students that they have some choice as to whether to participate or not. And I would say that the hallmarks of that pedagogy of choice are democratic and depend upon those critical abilities that we've talked about. The ability to think, the ability to criticise, the ability to put the common good before your own interest, the ability to put yourselves in the shoes of others, which is something that we literally do. And I often imagine if every subject in the curriculum was taught in every classroom as if children had the choice of being there. There has to be disinterested speech and action. That's the, you know, not doing what you want, but trying to think about what's in the common good. And there has, and this is the most critical part of it, there has to be empathetic imagination. You have to be able to imagine what it would be like to be somebody else. You have to try and understand how people who are different from you are coming to you, thinking about you, and how best to respond to them. And I should make this distinction between sympathy and empathy uh, in this context. You know, sympathy is a hug. Sympathy is, oh, I feel sorry for you, that's great, great. Empathy is a much, much more complicated thing. You know, I put that first slide up with Michael Gove because it's my democratic responsibility to have an empathetic understanding of Michael Gove. We will never agree. We will never share the, share the same view of what the world is, but I have to try and understand why he holds the beliefs he holds, why he does what he does. That's my democratic responsibility. And again, schools are where that should be learned or practiced or developed. <coughs> Children come in all sizes and shapes and all kinds of differences, and school is where they should be helped to learn how to live together and understand each other. As John Dewey reminds us, democracy must be born anew in every generation, and education is its mid midwife. I don't know why I think I put it out because of the picture, actually. <laughs> um, there is an increasing interest in the practices of ensemble, and I want to make the, make the suggestion that the idea of the ensemble is a very useful bridging metaphor between the worlds of theatre and the worlds of dem democracy, or at least the practices of theatre and the practices of democracy. And where drama teachers subscribe to this model, it's often as, because they want to try and create communities for living and learning in classrooms. And this is a, a quote from a, an actor. Some time back now, the RSC um, reclaimed the tradition of ensemble contracts and, and hired actors for two years, three years, rather than show by show. So they had a chance to live together, to learn together, to train together, and to make great art together. And Jeffrey Streetfield, who I don't think has got any particular interest in education, said this. Our ever-growing trust enables us to experiment, improvise, and rework on the floor with an astonishing freedom and confidence. This ensemble is a secure environment without ever being a comfort zone. All of us are continually challenging ourselves and being inspired by those around us to reach new levels in all aspects of our work. And it's what you want your classroom to be, but it might also be what we'd like the world to be. You know, my idealism is that in nurturing ensemble in young people, by working with democratic processes and understandings and developing the democratic capabilities that they require, that what I'm doing is helping to model a better world, a way that we might be an alternative, a choice. I want to return to this notion of empathy because it's so core to everything. And just to make the point, that, that, that empathy, like democracy, is not a Western invention. And it is not, doesn't belong either to the West. March makes the makes the point that there's a particular racism in the West that makes that assumption. You know, let's go back to the collapse of the Athenian Empire, or the collapse of Athens. Where would you go if you wanted to take your poetry, your understanding of politics, of philosophy, of mathematics, of science, you wanted to take that somewhere, where would you go? You could turn left and go to Western Europe, 
which is basically full of barbarians and Visigoths and cannibals and people eating each other and raping and pillaging, where there are no books, nothing. Well, you go east. Where in Iraq and Iran and the Indian subcontinent, you would find cities which had scholars, which had artists, which had scientists, which had philosophers, who more or less subscribed to some kind of democratic ideal. Which way would you turn? And by the time democracy returns to us in the West, it's been infused with all of that. So it's not just Athenian anymore. It's Asian. And we forget that in our teaching to kids. So this notion of humanity, of, of, of empathy being at the heart of it all, is something which is shared across, uh, across societies. Our only in the Q&A put it beautifully after 9-11 when he said, imagining what it is like to be someone other than yourself is at the core of our humanity. It is the essence of compassion. It is the beginning of morality. But Kong Ji, in the Analects, also says, the humane man, desiring to be established himself, seeks to establish others. Desiring himself to succeed, he helps others to succeed. To judge others by what one knows of oneself is the method of achieving humanity. In Shokotu, in Japan in the seventh century, nor let us be resentful when others differ from us. For all men have hearts, and each heart has its own leanings. Their right is our wrong, and our right is their wrong. And the, um, the ideogram there is, is Ren, humanity. And it says it all, doesn't it? I'm one, but I'm part of. Every time I put one up, I put two others. I am, because I am part of. And once that is gone, I lose my humanity. My liberal interpretation of it. I'm <laughs> proud of my Chinese friends, said you know, it's a liberal intent. And Martha Nussbaum reminds us of the importance of empathy, but also that it's a learned disposition. She writes, it's all too easy to see another person as just a body, which we might then think we can use for our own ends, bad or good. It is an achievement to see a soul in that body, and this achievement is supported by poetry and the arts, which ask us to wonder about the inner world of that shape we see, and two, to wonder about ourselves and our own depths. I said it came, comes from childhood, but it's also learned. And it's learned in schools. <coughs> And the poet, poetry and the humanities make a major contribution to that. So why would we marginalise them? Why would we downgrade them? Why would we say that they're not important to a successful life? And again, it's, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, this, what I'm talking to you about tonight was partly written in December and, and partly written more recently. And at the time I was coming, there was the, the shocking a report from the Child's Children's Commissioner into child sexual exploitation in gangs. You know, which said to us, if you think it's just men, adult men, who are out there doing these things, you are wrong. Children are raping and abusing each other because they have no empathetic imagination. They do not see each other as humans. They cannot imagine what it would be like to be in the shoes of whoever it is that they're exploiting. That's how bad it's <coughs> getting. But we should also bring that humaneness, humanity, being human, brings order to chaos. These were two remarkable pictures that came out of the same period in Cairo's recent history. One is of Muslim men protecting a Christian church so that Christians could pray and the other is of Christian men protecting a group of Muslims so they can pray. So in all of that, in all of that chaos, that anarchy, that cruelty, there's something essential about our humanity that drives some at least to say, no, I will protect you. I will put my life on the line to protect your right to freedom of belief, even though we have different belief systems and different faiths. I respect your right to pray in whatever way you wish. 
It's not really jolly so far, it's going to get worse, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I asked a question earlier on about why is this? Why is democracy in our schools under attack? Why are the arts and humanities, which are so essential to it, under attack? Well, let's start to unpick some of this. This you'd all be familiar with, which is the gap which we're all supposed to be closing. And it's horrific. And by the age of three, being in poverty makes a difference equivalent to nine months' development in school readiness. Before you even start, you do it. And then that dreadful statistic at the end, a student in a state school is as likely to go on to a leading university as a student from the independent sector who gets two grades lower at A level. So even, Mr Gove, if we get the attainment, it's still not going to make a difference. That's how difficult it is, and I'm just going to flash through this because I'm talking way too much now. But it's from Michelle Obama's report on the arts and humanities in America, and it's particularly the last bit. She's talking about how important the arts are, particularly to the disadvantaged, but she says, due to budget constraints and emphasis on the subject of high stakes testing, and I would to add to that politics, arts instruction in schools is on downward trend, and this is especially true for students from lower income schools, where analysis shows that access to the arts is disproportionately absent. If the arts are not important, why are they not important for everybody? Why is it that they're especially apparently unimportant to the most disadvantaged and vulnerable, the poorest in our schools? And this is a scary slide. You know? I put up there 85 to 3.5 billion. Does anybody know what that ratio refers to? Oxfam published a report last week, which in very elegant, statistical terms, but I'll give it you in its popular expression, showed that 85 people own more wealth than the bottom three and a half billion people on the planet. That means the number of people in this room, pretty much, own more wealth than the entire population of China. And this is the Gini coefficient, which is a scale used by the CIA to uh, estimate the likelihood of social instability and unrest in countries. And what it says is, if inequality gets to a certain level, then things are likely to go very badly. And what it does is look at the distribution. So if you're on zero, if you were on one, everybody in the, in the society would have the same amount of money. If on zero, then the top 1% would have it all. And 0 0.440 is the kind of tipping point. And as you will see, the OECD average is 0.32, China 0.48, so it's already tipped over it, 0.45 in America, so it's already tipped over. We're just on the verge of it, but we've, inequality has grown drastically in my lifetime, certainly. And good old Sweden's on 0.25, the <laughs> fairest, most equally distributed, most wonderful country, where they pay 68% tax. And we're squeamish of putting a 50% tax on. And the argument is that inequality, disengagement, self-interest are the antitheses of both drama and democracy. And the inequality, at the levels that it now is, is the greatest threat to the world. Because what we have are not authentic democracy, but owned politics, where the uber-rich can buy politics and make political laws which are in their own self-interest, not in the interest of the common good. And what examples are out there for children? Now these are, these are household names. You know, I grew up with these as complete respect and trust that these were you know, institutions that were fair-minded and ethically principled, and Adam Smith's invisible finger was making sure that everything was all right. <laughs> and this is just some of the fines, the, the millions and millions and billions of pounds of fines that, that have been put onto these companies for their illegal activities, which included fixing the mortgage rates so that the poor lost their homes, and selling dangerous drugs to children. What example is that to our youth? And let's return to Athens. This is a picture of 20 members of the parliament from the Golden Dawn Party being sworn into parliament by giving a fascist salute. And this is a picture in Athens of a theatre being ransacked by the same MPs supported by priests and supported by the public who ransacked the theatre, burnt it, broke the legs and arms of all of the actors because their crime was to put on a play by Terence McNally which suggested or imagined the idea of a gay Christ. 
I don't imagine a gay Christ, but I absolutely would die for your right to imagine that and to make a play about that. And once we start trashing your theatres, we're pretty well back where we were. You know, and the irony of that, of course, is that Shakespeare and his stakeholders were forced out of the city because of the Puritans. They took their, t their, their timbers and beams across the river and, and erected the globe, which is probably the most iconic, most lasting theatre of all time. The more you try to destroy it, the less like it is that you will succeed. And what about America then, the land of the free, the ultimate democracy? HB 2281 was passed by Arizona State Legislature. And what it did was to ban the teaching of Mexican-American studies in schools in Arizona. And the reason was that the effect of teaching Mexican-American studies was firstly to raise the standard of Mexican-American students, but more dangerously, what it did was to persuade Mexican-Americans that they were Mexican-Americans. Mm -hmm. Rather than being individuals, they started to see themselves as a collective group. And so Mexican-American studies were banned, and so were a number of books banned at the same time. So you cannot use Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which I suppose makes sense, but you cannot, in Arizona, have in the school let alone teach a copy of William Shakespeare's Tempest. Right? Some of the circularities of this speech are beginning to come home. And if that's not scary enough, remember what I said, that critical thinking, critique, the right to criticism are essential to a democratic life. The Texican Republican Party in their manifesto of 2012, and they came to power, had this <coughs> promise. We oppose the teaching of higher order thinking skills. We oppose the teaching of higher order thinking skills. Values clarification, critical thinking skills and similar programs, which are simply a relabeling of outcome-based education, which focus on behavior modification and have the purpose of challenging the students' fixed beliefs and undermining parental authority. What happens when a democracy bans the very skills that are required for democratic citizenship. And why would they do that? And they're not just in the West, of course, as well. You will recognise the iconic figure of, of Malala. And uh, I wanted to just read a little bit from, well, I mean, you, you know the story of Malala. She fought for the right for girls to be <coughs> educated uh, in Afghanistan. She was very vocal about that. One day she got on the school bus, it was stopped, a man got on, asked who she was, and shot her at point blank twice in the head because she wanted an education. And she came to Birmingham, which I'm very proud about, and recovered, and later spoke to the United Nations, as you might know. So let's just hear what she had to say. Dear brothers and sisters, we must not forget that millions of people are suffering from poverty and injustice and ignorance. We must not forget that millions of children are out of their schools. We must not forget that our sisters and brothers are waiting for a bright, peaceful future. So, let us wage a glorious struggle against illiteracy, poverty and terrorism. Let us pick up our books and our pens. They are the most powerful weapons. One child, one teacher, one book and one pen can change the world. Education is the only solution. Education first, thank you. And for the English teachers in this room, one child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. And let's bring it back to Shakespeare. There was a wonderful exhibition at the British Library two years ago, I suppose, was it two years ago? Shakespeare in his world, and one of the key exhibits was this book, come to be known as the Robin Island Bible, which was a copy of the complete works of Shakespeare, which Sonny Vin Catherine when he went to Robin Island, was allowed to take, because at that time you could have one book for your own education. And shortly after that right was taken away, all books were confiscated, including, including that one. And later, apocryphal perhaps, later he found himself in a hymn practice in the chapel, and they had no hymnals, so he was sent into the stock cupboard to bring out the hymn books, and he saw the Shakespeare book. So he smuggled it out, put these pictures around, told the guards that it was a Hindu Bible, no such thing, obviously, and they believed him, and then it was passed around amongst the other prisoners. 
not just because it was Shakespeare, obviously, because it was available, but also because it was a secular text. You know, Robin Island was full of prisoners of different faiths, the Quran, the Bible, but Shakespeare gave them a way of talking about politics and thinking politically from a secular perspective. It encouraged the debate. And what's interesting about that is that it was a tradition amongst the ANC which started in the elite Methodist schools that they went to, where the teachers of English believed that by giving Shakespeare and other great works of literature, what they were doing was civilising the South African youth in the classroom, that it was the great gift that the West could give. But there was real struggles in those classrooms between teachers who wanted to give the gift and students who said, no, we will only read this literature if we can debate it afterwards. The only purpose of literature <coughs> is as a catalyst to political debate. So we will read, but then we demand the time to talk together, to consider the questions that have been raised, to consider the meanings, to consider the interpretations, and to use that dialogue as a way of helping us to understand who we are and who we are becoming, just as the Athenians had used the theatre. And this is again, of course, a familiar struggle in our own diverse and multicultural classrooms between the passive and uncritical imposition of literature, particularly Shakespeare on young people, and the desire for English classrooms to be a site of struggle between different conceptions of power, identity, and the role of debate and the free exchange of ideas in a democratizing community. In a country which has erased speaking and listening from the curriculum, which is probably pretty close to erasing higher order thinking schools, to raise speaking and listening from our classroom, because as the former Minister for Schools, Nick Gibbs, said, there is too much waffle going on in classrooms already. I'm going to finish in a moment, but I've got one trick left. It's only a trick because I left it in my bag and I should have brought it out. <laughs> I just wanted to read you one more thing. To finish with a reading, because it seems appropriate. I'm proud to be an English teacher as well as being a drama teacher. And you'll have to be patient while I find it. Yeah, the book is Night John, and it, uh, it tells the story of uh, Sani, a girl brought into, uh, born into slavery and her struggle to read. And um, a slave comes onto the plantation, it's called Night John, badly beaten, scarred man. And Sani and Night John form a relationship. And Night John agrees to teach her to read, which of course was punishable by death or by uh, amputation. So, B, we've learned A and now we're going to learn B. B, he said, it'd be B. That sounds crazy. That's how you say the letter B. It's for B or boo or boo. That's how it B looks and how you make the sound. I made it sound in my mouth, whispering. So where's the bottom to it? I swear, you always want to know the bottom to things. Here, here it is. It sits on itself this way, facing sort of two round places pushed to the front. Suddenly he's gone. One second he's there, the next he's slammed sideways and gone. What are you doing to her? Mammy was standing there, big and black and tall in the moonlight. What are you doing to this girl? She'd come from the side and fetched John such a blow in his head that it knocked him back into the wall and on his back. He came up quick and didn't cower her. Nothing. Not like you think. I'm, I'm teaching her to read. That's what I mean, Mammy said. What the hell are you doing? Don't you know what they do to her if they find her trying to read? We already got one girl torn to pieces by the whip and the dogs. We don't need two. I've been quiet all this time, watching. It didn't seem so bad what he was doing, teaching me a few letters to know, maybe a word or two. So I said, it doesn't seem so bad. bad. Then she hissed like a snake. Child, they'll cut your thumbs off if you learn to read. They'll whip you until your back looks knitted, until it looks like his back. She pointed to John, big old finger. Is that how you got whipped? He shook his head. I ran and got caught. Not the first time. She waited. I waited. 
First time I ran, I got clean away. I went north all the way. I was free. I never heard such a thing. We couldn't even talk about being free. And he was a man said he had been free by running north. I thought, how can that be? You ran and got away, Mammy said. I did. You ran until you were clean away? I did. And you came back? I did. Why? He sighed, and it sounded like his voice, like his laugh, low and way off thunder. It made me think he was going to promise something, the way thunder promises rain. For this. What do you mean this? To teach reading. You know, teaching is the most honourable profession. And being a teacher of English, being a teacher of the humanities, believing that what you are doing is creating the possibility of a democratic future for the children in our classrooms, there's nothing more honourable than that. So go forward and do that.